I'm Vice President for Research and Programs here at CSIS. The topic today is security in the Mediterranean. We're honored to have General Jim Jones here. After General Jones speaks, he'll have a conversation with Steve Flanagan, who's our Senior Vice President and Kissinger Chair and our resident NATO expert, and John Alterman, who's our Director of our Middle East Program. Um, to introduce General Jones, we're honored to have uh, Admiral Guido Venteroni. He has served at the highest levels of the Italian Armed Services and NATO and he's currently serves on Fin Mechanica's board, and we're grateful for Fin Mechanica to making this possible today. Admiral. Hi, Jim. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I have the honor today to introduce a man who actually does not need an introduction. <laughs> but having asked to do that, I'm very pleased to do. Very pleased because I've known General Jones and I've appreciated his uh, high, high qualities. Uh, I must say the, uh, the uh, subject of this panel is the, Medi the Mediterranean. I think you can understand that being from Italy, having spent most of my life as sailor in the waters of the Mediterranean, and being a flyer, of course, uh, 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 flying above those waters, I, I am particularly interested on what we are going to listen today. In uh, all my career, I've tried to emphasize the importance of the Mediterranean. Now, I think that, that it is clear to many, because we have all those instabilities within the Mediterranean, but in the past, it was considered, especially during the Cold War, was considered a kind of marginal theater. Actually, it has never been a marginal theater. You may remember that we have the long-standing Middle East problems, Arab, Israel, Palestinian problem, and so forth. And of course, during the Cold War, the Mediterranean was, in the Mediterranean, we had the deployment of the Sixth Fleet, which was a very important asset for NATO and the alliance as a whole. So for me, the Mediterranean has always been important. And today, we will have an update on this importance, I think. But let me now say a few words about General Jones. I am a military. I've spent most of my life in the military. So when I look at uh, a colleague or, uh, let's say, cur curriculum, I start from the beginning, because the starting point is, in my view, the most important one. Now, General Jones started as Marine Corps officer, second lieutenant, I think, 1967. He was commissioned, he went through the course, and then he was deployed in Vietnam right away. And in Vietnam, he had what we call the baptism of fire. Now, if there is something that reveals the stature and the nature of a man, is combat. And he went into combat right away. And he was decorated twice for gallantry. And of course, he was promoted. And he was platoon commander, company commander. Now, nothing enhances the natural leadership and command capabilities of a man like commanding the soldiers on the feet. But the soldiers that you see every day, every day, and you share with them hardship and dangers. So the starting point is the, was, was the right one to highlight his qualities and his nature. 
And then let me jump to his late, to the late stage of his career. I had just left uh, NATO and had retired. I had been uh, chairman of the NATO Military Committee when he became, when General Jones became Supreme Allied Commander Europe and Commander of U.S. Forces in Europe. And when he took his post, he wanted to do something that was very unusual. Had been, no one had, had done that. He wanted to create a group of mentors to assist him the best way possible because NATO was in a transitional phase and so he wanted me to join this mentors group. So I was associated with him in the years 2005, 2006 and I knew that he did not need any mentors but I was I deeply appreciated this type of approach to uh, his new uh, responsibilities. I'm grateful to him. Of course, I told him after a while that he could, he could <laughs> just walk <laughs> on his feet. And it, of course, this was well known to me even before. So thank you very much, Jim, for what you have done for your country, of course, but also for the NATO alliance to which I have belonged all my life. And let me say two things that make us even closer. First, he has nine grandchildren and me too. <laughs> this is this is the first thing, and you will, you will learn that he, if you watch carefully as a grandfather, you can watch what the children do as they grow up. As parents, you normally overlook this. Uh, and if you look carefully to the children while they grow up, you will understand the world, how mankind, how humanity is made, because their nature is evident since they are born. The second, the second point is that we have both been basketball player. Now, do not laugh. <laughs> 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 if he stands up, you can understand. He, of course, is a natural ba basketball player. But, of course, I am a little bit older, and the average, the average stature at my time, it was a, a, a little bit less. But nevertheless, I am short anyway. <laughs> I cannot hide this. So, but I was a good playmaker. I was agile. I was, of course, played in the Italian Naval Academy, Academy uh, basket uh, team, bas basketball team. And I loved it. And this is the second sport and family. And with this, I think I can conclude wishing you, Jim, best luck for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Admiral, thank you very much uh, for that very kind introduction. And thank you for the human touch you put on it at the end. Uh, <clears throat> I, uh, you know, everything's relative. Uh, the other day, I met Kareem Abdul-Jabbar for the first time, and uh, you know, I was kind of looking up like that. So I totally understand the uh, the the fact is that uh, you know sports plays an important part in our in our development, and, and uh, I certainly appreciated my days uh, uh, on the field. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about. Uh, a, a part of the world that is uh, still very strategically important. Um, it's, uh, it's an area that uh, sometimes we've taken for granted, as the Admiral said. Uh, it's a uh, strategically, strategically important, although we haven't always realized it uh, to its full extent. Um, and then we're going to have some panel discussion and then some Q's and A's. And 
on the, on the questions and answers. I remember once when I was Commandant of the Marine Corps, uh, lecturing at the Marine Corps Command and Staff College, a school just down the road here at Quantico, mostly majors and, and lieutenant colonels. And uh, so I finished my remarks, threw it open for questions, and this immediately, the spring bud of the class jumped up and, and asked a very tough question. And I really didn't want to take it on, so I kind of waffled it a little bit and went on to another question. And uh, I could tell by his expression that he wasn't thrilled with my answer. So he, he raised his hand again, uh, acknowledged him again, he rephrased the question. Again, I gave him a soft answer, and it was went on like this for a third time as well. And finally, when he posed this question a third time, I said, you know, Major, you're really asking a very difficult question here. And he said, well, you know, General, I'm sure you didn't get to be a general by asking easy questions when you were in this class. And I said, no, but it helped me make Lieutenant Colonel. <laughs> So the Mediterranean um, uh, in the 20th century is, is obviously known to a lot of us. Uh, if, you, if you look uh, during the Cold War, if you look at uh, the evolution of not only the NATO commands, but also the U.S. European Command, um, the U.S. European Command was a, a name that was uh, um, I never really thought about until I became the U.S. European Commander, and I looked at what my responsibilities were, and most of them were African. If you counted up the countries, uh, most of the countries in the U.S. European Command were African. And uh, I've always thought that um, uh, you know, we, have, we, the United States, has had a very strong and well-developed east-west orientation in its, uh, in its efforts and its dialogue. And we have omitted uh, many times our attention in our own hemisphere and almost uh, totally omitted uh, focusing on the importance of, of Africa. Um, and so uh, I was happy to be at the forefront of the discussion that led to the creation of AFRICOM um, during my watch. And um, uh, the only thing that saddens me is that AFRICOM is in Germany. Uh, it would be a lot better, I think, if it was in Africa. But when you go around advertising a unified command as a combatant command, you know, what head of state in his right mind is going to say, oh, yeah, you can put a combatant command in my, in my country. So this, um, you know, I prefer titles like unified command. I, uh, I prefer um, taking these very, very important uh, commands and making them uh, more user friendly, that is, more representative of the whole of government, uh, which is uh, part of the global development uh, topic that we discussed earlier at CSIS. Um, but for the most part, the, the Mediterranean uh, has really been a focus of ours that uh, has largely been to the north, on the northern rim of the Mediterranean. Um, having been uh, a six fleet uh, marine sailor many times, um, you know, most of the times when we pulled into port or did any operations, it was always on the northern rim. You know, the, the, the Liberty ports in the spring uh, in the Mediterranean were usually Marseille, Cannes, uh, Mallorca, um, Turkey, uh, Israel, you know, very few times did we actually uh, visit um, southern rim ports. Um, so, um, but, but the, the strategic importance of the Mediterranean and its choke points, uh, starting with Gibraltar and going on to all the way up into the Black Sea through the Suez Canal, uh, continues to be, I think, one of the areas of the world that we have to pay attention to, and obviously, uh, in light of what's going on now in North Africa, uh, we definitely have to pay attention to it. Um, this century is a, is a century that announces itself uh, over the last decade now, 10 years have already gone by, so we're well into this century in understanding what it is. And it is a century that's very full of uh, asymmetric threats, and those, those threats aren't going, aren't going to go away. And the challenge is we have an asymmetric threat uh, envelope uh, in a symmetric way of responding to them, uh, which doesn't always work very well. The 21st century is uh, characterized by not only asymmetric threats, but also the speed of information, the speed of knowledge. Um, people all over the world are really starting to understand how some of the other world lives, and, and what's happened in, the, um, in North Africa, I think, is an expression, a popular expression, not one that's 
inspired by Al Qaeda or any other terrorist network, but a popular expression uh, derived from increased knowledge and awareness by um, the next generation of, of people, young people, who want to be governed differently and want more transparency in how they're governed and want better opportunities for themselves economically. Um, and so the, the three aspects of what goes into making that possible um, are uh, fundamental to, I think, whatever we do. Uh, every, uh, the problems in North Africa are similar in many ways, but they're also, each one of them is very different. And we have to take them one at a time. Um, the, the changing dimension of our security uh, portfolio uh, means that um, no longer is it going to be enough to just send in the Sixth Fleet, for example, or the Air Force, or, or, the, or the Marines, or the, or the, or the soldiers, uh, or a combination thereof. Um, it has to be, we have to um, uh, deal with these uh, strategic problems in ways that um, uh, allow us to do what we do best, and that is to apply a whole of government approach. And it's not just a national effort, it's got to be an international effort as well. So the, the three pillars uh, of engagement for my, for my money in terms of anything that's going on in the Mediterranean are obviously security is one pillar. The second one is um, uh, economic, some economic development. And the third um, is governance and, and rule of law. And there's a lot of other subcategories to that. But fundamentally, when we talk about things like freedom and democracy and more transparency in government, we've been talking about this for a long time. We've, we've suggested for many, across many um, administrations to um, various leaders uh, in, in different countries, the idea that this, this bottom-up effort by, by people is, is something you can't, you can't stop. You can't, you can't squash it, and eventually it, it will find its, uh, it will find its, its day. Uh, the, only, the only difficulty is in predicting uh, when, the, when something like that is going to happen, and you know, no one could have predicted that the spark in Tunisia that, that caused it. But now it's, it's on a roll, and it's, um, it's hard to say where it's going to stop. Um, and so, you know, critically, I think, uh, important in this is that uh, while we have a special challenge with regard to addressing this next generation of leaders as they come up, because some of them are upset with us because we supported um, one way or the other, uh, the, the previous generation that they're obviously unhappy with, um, so we have to figure out exactly how we're going to engage with uh, with these new leaders and make sure that um, democracy and freedom uh, has an opportunity to be successful because you know nothing is a, nothing's a given here. Thirty years ago in Iran, the the, the downfall of the Shah uh, was largely in the name of more transparency, a freer society, and more options and more opportunity, um, and different type of government. And they sure got a different kind of government. And thirty years later, uh, we're still dealing with. Uh, with that situation, we we cannot afford to make to take our eyes off the ball with regard to what's going on uh, around the Mediterranean. Uh, certainly, our European friends understand that because of the proximity of the borders. They have, um, in addition to uh, a lot of trade relations and uh, energy dependence and the like, but you also have uh, some not so good things that could happen: um, illegal immigration, uh, human trafficking, uh, narco terrorism. Uh, the combination of the emerging combination of organized crime with uh, narco trafficking and terror, all, all three of those things working together. Uh, the distances are not that great, so it's very easy to understand you know, why our European friends are concerned. And, and therefore, because we are uh, part of uh, the alliance, uh, we should be concerned. As a matter of fact, uh, within the NATO alliance, there's, a, there's an organization that not many people know about. It's called the Mediterranean Dialogue. The Mediterranean Dialogue has about seven countries in it, as I recall. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it, it is, uh, it is a, uh, essentially a political military uh, body that gets together, and I hope they still do, but they, we, at least in the 2003 uh, time frame, we resurrected it. And uh, Israelis were sitting across the table from Egyptians with Tunisians, with Algerians, uh, 
Mauritanians um, and, uh, and Jordanians uh, and um, Egyptians, and, and, and having real dialogue. And uh, this dialogue was substantive, and, um, and it's, it's, so, so there's a framework there where people can talk to each other, where militaries can exchange views, and it's, uh, it's within NATO. Um, so regarding the Mediterranean and, and all that's going on there, regardless of how different it is, from my standpoint, um, this is a very historical moment, and, and we need to make sure, and we need to do whatever we need to do to make sure that it comes out all right, because the consequences are going to be extremely long-lasting. Uh, we don't know how Syria is going to, going to work itself out. You can be sure that Iran is doing what it needs to do to try to make sure that they, it comes out the way they want it to come out. Um, and so while we have this you know, overt uh, cover of uh, democratic uh, tendencies, you can be sure that under the waves there's a lot going on to make sure that uh, the democracy doesn't, uh, doesn't take, take hold and that uh, Iran uh, continues to um, avoid uh, you know, the scrutiny of the world with regard to its nuclear weapons program, its uh, fundamental support to terrorist organizations and the like. In the Middle East, um, you know, I, don't, I don't know what more to say about the Middle East peace process except that um, this, is, this is also a part of, of the, uh, the whole panoply of, uh, of events. And to think that, that now is not the time to make strides uh, in, in this process, I think, is a, is a strategic mistake of hopefully not historical consequences. But uh, I think it's quite possible that uh, by not uh, moving forward on the peace process uh, on the part of either Israel or uh, the Palestinians is a, is a, a mistake. And I hope that, um, uh, that we can find the, find the, the right vehicle to, uh, to move that in the right direction. Um, so the, on the positive side of things, the, you know, well, the current crisis is not terrorist uh, organization inspired. Um, we have, this, we have this, uh, this real pivot point where things could go one way or the other, and we have to be, be careful uh, to do the right thing. Uh, we should pay close attention to our European friends uh, who, A, know more, a lot more about the area than we do uh, and obviously have, uh, have a tremendous interest. Um, but even if it stopped tomorrow, even if the problems just somehow miraculously just stopped and froze in place, um, things will, won't be the same in that region, uh, in my view. This is a, a historical change. It's coming from the bottom up. It's coming from the people. And uh, I think uh, leaders all over the world, or particularly those who are, shall we say, non-democratic, are really looking over their shoulder and, and wondering uh, you know, if it's going to happen in, in their backyard. Um, and, uh, and I think that uh, we'll, time will tell. Uh, there's in, it's impossible to predict how this is going to how this is all going to work out, but things will certainly not be the same. Um, the, um, finally, one last point is the, um, I think that, that great effort should be, should be made to consult with uh, our friends and allies, especially now. Um, we have got to um, make sure that Iran uh, does not escape um, uh, and avoid the scrutiny that it, it, it richly deserves, and as it uh, is, is the, it is the big cloud that hangs over the entire region, and it has the uh, the possibility of uh, of adversely impacting any number of uh, outcomes um, in this um, in this uh, current um, uh, period of instability. Um, one way in which to uh, that that holds a lot of attraction to me, in which um, we can uh, successfully engage, I think, uh, in these uh, developing countries, this movement towards uh, democracy, is to uh, think about um, a lesson that, uh, we, uh, that we all learned in, after World War II with the Marshall Plan. Um, and uh, if you take the, the three legs of the triad that I talked about, uh, security, economic development, and governance and rule of law, um, 
it seems to me that, uh, that the, the wealthier nations uh, of the planet, uh, but with special emphasis perhaps on Europe and, and uh, China and uh, maybe Brazil and, and uh, India, um, could get together and um, help usher in this, uh, a new economic uh, order, if you will, a new uh, encouragement uh, for better governance and, and along democratic uh, lines. And uh, obviously the security piece would depend on, on which country we're talking about, but uh, somehow a, uh, an international effort uh, to bring about the, to help bring about the change and bridge the uh, the um, the gap that might exist uh, presently with regard to uh, you know future relations with uh, with with the United States um, might uh, might be very helpful and I think that this is one way to to uh, continue the the war against terrorism if you give people hope uh, economically and and better governance. Um, and they're meeting their expectations that they can see that the next generation, their children, uh, will be better and will we'll be better off and have better opportunities. And I think that's something that, uh, that we should think about. We cannot sit back and just watch things happen. Uh, this, is, this is not a time for the passive. This is a time for the bold. And that's why I think that um, uh, certain leaders uh, in the region need to stand up and say the right thing. Certain organizations need to uh, also stand up and do the right thing from the uh, Arab League to the African Union, to NATO, to the European Union, to the UN. Uh, all of these international organizations um, can play a role in how this, uh, how this comes out. And it doesn't have to be uh, it doesn't have to be bad news and it doesn't have to, and, and we can come out of this in a way that fosters our, our values, our leadership, and uh, creates a, a, a new dimension of communications with the emerging, uh, the emerging uh, new leaders of uh, certain countries that are making a move towards uh, perhaps their last uh, best hope at uh, having a better life for themselves and for their follow-on follow -on, uh, generations. So thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, General. Um, in, in thinking through the application of, of these ideas and, and the problem of coordination and, and resources, uh, I'm, I'm struck that we didn't really discuss the ongoing coordinated, coordinated NATO campaign in Libya. Um, as we look to assisting Libya in what I think we all assume will be some sort of transition to something, uh, we don't so much have a resource problem because Libya has lots of oil, but the record of democratization in countries with lots of mineral resources is poor. There's a capacity problem, uh, especially among the Libyans who've, who've lived under Gaddafi. And there's a coordination problem, not only among the allies in general, but we don't have a presence on the ground. So given that you talked about the importance of pivot points, you talked about the importance of getting Iran wrong. What do we need to do now as a country and as part of NATO to get Libya right? Well, uh, um, that's a very complex question, but uh, I think one part of the answer that I would give is that whatever we do with Libya, let's not forget that strategically um, Egypt uh, is certainly uh, the, 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 the point of main effort. Um, what we're talking in Libya is uh, what we're talking about in Libya here is tactics, uh, pretty much, um, and and it's I, I don't think we have the clarity yet to see how this is all going to play out in terms of the uh, the NATO uh, action thus far. Um, I know that uh, the uh, elements of the regime have reached out, uh, you know, unofficially around the world to try to see if there's a a way out of this, but uh, I, I don't really know uh, exactly um, whether they are at a, a breaking point uh, to, or how much longer this can go on. Uh, depending on who you talk to, some people say that you know at the current rate that this this government can can hold off for a long, long time. That's not a good. That's not a good. That's not a good sign. But um, 
But I think that the next thing that has to happen in Libya is obviously some sort of, uh, uh, some sort of uh, answer to the, the current crisis in terms of the government. And, um, and once that's resolved, then I think um, you know the international community has to uh, apply the you know some element of those three uh, pillars: the security envelope, which we're seeing develop now, followed by uh, some economic uh, uh, incentives, and then obviously the biggest one is uh, governance and rule of law and how how they're going to fit in uh, in North Africa. Well, General, can I? Uh press you on that issue a little bit and, and recalling uh, your experience uh, also in leading the Iraq Security Forces Commission. Uh, clearly we've seen in Libya, unlike Egypt, the army and the security forces have been used as an instrument of repression uh, by the government. And uh, whatever, however this ends, assuming that Gaddafi is no longer in power, there'll be a need for some kind of security assistance uh, with the international community transition to help the, if it is the uh, interim transition Coun national council that is that is ultimately taking over governance, but somehow it seems it'll be incumbent on the international community, beginning with NATO and the, and the members of the coalition that have supported uh, uh, the effort to protect the Libyan people to allow them to determine their future. I wonder how you see, looking back at that experience, or if you've thought about it. There hasn't obviously been a lot of discussion in in public about this, but I, I'm hoping, and I assume that there has been some discussion about this uh, within government circles. Uh, what role should NATO and the EU play? What role could other organizations, regional uh, uh, partners, uh, the uh, Arab League, um, Turkey, other countries, yeah. in sort of stabilization so that the process, just as in Iraq, that first we have to establish security, then we can talk about new governmental structure and rule right. of law. So how do we avoid the mistakes or, or the, the aftermath of the, of, the, of the Iraq situation in Libya? Well, I, I think one of the... Uh, the best thing that, that, that happened, at least in the uh, body politic uh, internationally, is that uh, the Arab League was involved from day one. And I would say you know, the involvement of the African Union is also extremely important. Uh, the neighborhood has to be concerned about this. And this cannot be a Western European uh, solution set uh, that is somehow uh, dictated from Brussels or, or, or any other capital. Uh, I, and. But the good news is that once we have more clarity in terms of the government, mm -hmm. that there's you know enormous capacity out there uh, in the uh, within the Arab uh, Arab world, but also within the European and and uh, more global interests. And I, I think that one way in which the United States can help is not to do it all by ourselves, but to become a a catalyst for. Uh, other uh, rapidly growing economies to also uh, understand that they have a stake in this, and um, and to join us in, in a in a comprehensive, well articulated international effort to show the people of uh, of Libya or Tunisia or Egypt um, or any other country that's moving in the in the direction that uh, that you know seems to indicate that they'll they're moving towards a freer more democratic society, to show that there's, you know, there's, um, there's a waiting world out there that's ready to welcome them if that's what they want. Uh, and that's the direction they're moving in. Uh, the risk, of course, is that we don't do anything. And this, uh, these very definite uh, subversive elements that are operating under the cover of this uh, euphoric move towards uh, freedom um, are probably very well organized, very well funded. And, might uh, just um, you know snatch uh, snatch the victory uh, at the end of the day. So we have to we have to watch that very carefully. Mm -hmm. um, I'm delighted that you talked about Egypt being strategically important because I've been paying close attention to Egypt for 20 years, and we'll just take the next hour and talk about Egypt. Um, when, when we talk about a, a more democratic transition in Egypt, one of the things that is likely to mean is greater Islamist participation in politics. And that sent up some alarm bells on Capitol Hill about what that might look like. It's not about the impoverished because the Muslim Brotherhood is principally a middle class, upper middle class movement of professionals. That's where their base is. Uh, so economic growth doesn't help that problem. What it may do is nudge Egypt's foreign policy in the direction that Turkey's foreign policy has been going, which is to make it less compliant with the United States. It could have implications for the 
Egyptian-Israeli relationship and the way Israelis feel in the neighborhood and everything else. As we think about where Egyptian politics go, how should we think about Islam in politics, its potential impacts on Egyptian foreign policy and what that would mean for American interests? Well, I think we probably should be pretty happy if uh, Egypt turned out to be like Turkey, frankly. I, I, uh, I think uh, d despite some of the, uh, the ins and outs of uh, most recent uh, policies with regard to sanctions on Iran on their, as a result of their nuclear program, um, the, the relationships uh, at the very senior levels between the Turkish and American governments have, are generally quite good. Uh, we do have a big PR problem um, in Turkey uh, in terms of how they look at the United States, and we have a big PR problem in a lot of the Muslim world uh, in terms of how they look at the United States because our, our critics will say, well, these are the guys that supported you know, the guys that you're trying to replace or that, you're, that you have replaced in the case of Egypt. Um, so how can they be your friends? And, you know, I think that uh, I think there is a way in which we can, um, you know, find a, a accommodation and good relations by doing the things that would encourage them um, across, uh, you know, the, 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 the three areas that I, that I discussed. Um, that would help them be whatever it's going to be. I mean, there, there are some things that we're not going to control. And so we're looking for the best possible outcome. And, and to me, the best possible outcome is to help them develop a society that is you know, representative of the way they want to be governed, but also has transparency, uh, respect for human rights, and, uh, and, and can be welcomed into the family of nations um, with you know, proper support of, of economic assistance, uh, forgiveness of debt, and things of that nature uh, that would show that we are a nation that is trying to become, trying to be friendly, trying to be helpful, and trying to welcome them uh, into, the, into this new phase of their history. Uh, but it's extremely important that we be successful here. I can't, I can't stress sure. that enough. So is that doing more than the administration's done with the billion dollars in loan relief, the billion dollars in OPIC guarantees, $150 million in immediate aid. I mean, are we talking about increasing the military aid more than $1.3 billion a year? Well, are we talking uh, about additional economic Well, again, assistance? I mean, you know, there's a national policy here, and then there's an international leadership responsibility here. And, and uh, you know, we all, unfortunately, this happens at a really bad economic time. So I'm, I'm not suggesting that, that the United States uh, do what we typically do is more than anybody else. Uh, proportionally, but I do think that we can play a big role internationally in um, in properly funding those those things through international cooperation, um, and it's in all of our interests that this work out work out the right way. So um, I think I think symbolically um, this is a good start what, what the administration uh, proposed, um, but I also think that that we need to work. Um, uh, develop our leadership commitment to making this um, a um, a successful um, a successful effort that that has uh, international participation. Well, actually, General, I would like to ask you about some of that. How we might orchestrate that within the broader international community? Of course, beginning with our partners in the European Union, which, as you noted, have been part of the Mediterranean dialogue in the security sector. They've had the EU Barcelona process. Uh, working with those countries in the Mediterranean region. Uh, clearly, Turkey is very interested and engaged in all of these countries. Uh, there's been a great deal of discussion about the Turkish inspiration, uh, not the model, but the inspiration on the idea you, you yourself alluded to Turkey uh, as uh, if, if Egypt turned out the way Turkey uh, did over the course of the next 30 years, that would, would be a, quite, a, quite an achievement. Uh, I wonder, do you see a way to orchestrate this and, and perhaps even uh, an opportunity here to advance uh, U.S. cooperation with both the European Union and Turkey in a common project in promoting common change, uh, uh, promoting positive change uh, in political systems, the rule of law, um, obviously being very careful to listen to the demand side and not trying to, we, we saw the Bush period where uh, it seemed as if the U.S. And, and some others had this idea through the Greater Middle East Initiative of, of, uh, of imposing a model on some of the Arab countries. That didn't work. Uh, certainly, 
we've seen from the Egyptians and others, they, they, they have some of their own ideas, but how do you think we could orchestrate this? Uh, and, and is this indeed a, maybe an opportunity to have a common positive project involving uh, the U.S., the European Union, and Turkey, which of course is having its own problems in, in the accession discussions uh, with the European Union, to put, put our common efforts together at a time uh, of austerity, uh, at least uh, in the case of, of our own government and the European Union governments? Well, you know, one of the things that happened in, in 2009 and one of the things that facilitated the, uh, the uh, reset of the relation, our relationship with Russia was Iran. Um, and uh, as a matter of fact, in early 2009, nobody, I think, would have predicted that China, Russia, and the United States would agree on sanctions uh, for, um, you know, uh, against Iran. Uh, yet it happened. Um, I think that this is an opportunity for uh, to go beyond a little bit what you're suggesting. I mean, I think that at a minimum we should be doing that. But I think there are other uh, other um, economies that are doing quite well, uh, Brazil, India, and China, uh, that could be brought into this discussion, um, and not only here, but in places like Afghanistan and Pakistan as well. But where um, the, the, the developed part of the, the developed nations, if you will, or the wealthier nations, however you want to phrase it, um, have a, uh, um, it's in our strategic interest to help these developing countries get to where they want to be. And, there's, and each one will be different. Um, on the question of energy, for example, we have a number of, of developing countries that are rapidly approaching that stage in their uh, energy portfolio where they have to decide whether they're going to go into the pollution stage or we're going to, you know, go to go to clean energy. And countries like ours are going to have to decide, you know, how we make those technologies available to them so they can skip that that uh, that generation of, of, of or that that aspect of uh, energy development. Um, so it's not all going to be the same, but um, th this is a time where proactive engagement. Uh, has to replace reactive engagement. I mean, we, 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 we emerged from the 20th century, which is where our institutions were very reactive. And we had a much different ordered world. We had time to debate things. We had time to move issues along and along uh, the international you know, debating societies and so on and so forth. Um, time, time is not on our side here. The events are moving too rapidly. Too many things are happening on the globe simultaneously, and we need uh, we need more agility in not only being able to respond to things that surprise us, but also to be able to um, prevent uh, future conflicts from happening through uh, a prescription that could be written out earlier. It would be a lot cheaper than having to uh, uh, let the let the uh, the cancer, if you will, to use a medical term, met metastasize, and then you have to go in and really. Um, you know, spend 10 years or so like we've been doing in some of these countries to, uh, to fix it. So a, a proactive uh, strategy uh, with the proper leadership by the countries that can make a difference, I think, can profoundly uh, affect the outcome of this um, quest for more freedom on the part of several, several nations, and I would imagine there are going to be more. Um, and. Um, and, and can uh, you know shape I think uh, the uh, the 21st century in, in a completely different way if we do it right. You you mentioned Iran as as sort of an example of things that went wrong, and we talked about the strategic importance of Egypt. I was giving a talk uh, a few weeks ago, and, and somebody said, "Well, I understand that Turkey is the positive model for how Egypt comes out. How do we keep Turkey, uh, Egypt from turning into Pakistan?" We've had a long relationship with the Pakistani military. We've had an involved policy with the yeah. Pakistani military. What lessons should we draw from that experience to avoid uh, going there at this strategic juncture? You know, I mean, we all draw lessons from our life cycle experiences. Probably the biggest lesson in, in my life and something I've always tried to do uh, in trying to understand f uh, things that are happening around the globe is, is um, what do the people want? I mean, what do the masses want? Um, we can't want something for them that they don't want for themselves. I'm convinced of that. Um, 
we can't want in, in for um, Afghanistan, we can't want democracy and, and you know, good governance and all of the things that we, the, the things that we value. But we can't want that unless the people themselves in Afghanistan also want it. And they have to want it more. Um, um, and, and so I think that there's a certain, you know, there's a certain step that you have to take before you, you can't do everything. So you have to take a, you have to take a, a make a certain value uh, judgment on what is, the, what is the movement here. And, and sometimes it's blindingly apparent, like in Egypt. You know, there's no question about what, where the people were going with this thing. So that, in a sense, that question has been asked and answered for Egypt. And how you prevent them from, um, you know, becoming another, another Pakistan is going to depend a lot on the, the institutions that are currently there. And happily, the army has generally behaved responsibly. Uh, we'll see what the elections in September look like, obviously. Um, but this is a very, very pivotal time, and we should be, uh, I think, in conjunction with other countries, we should be working, watching very, very closely to make sure that we are helpful in ways that can be helpful, and that we also understand what's going on under the under the waves, in terms of trying to destabilize Egypt and make it and turn it into uh, another Pakistan, which a country like Yemen might become, for example, um, and and that may be. That may be already too late. Well, actually, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Yemen. And by the way, just for our audience, we're going to continue as the two point guards here, continuing to pass to our Star Center forward, and then we'll turn it over to you shortly uh, to some general questions. But on Yemen, um, uh, as we discussed before the program uh, began, uh, Secretary Kissinger has written about the transition strategy in Afghanistan and sort of the whole question of um, the growing cry that uh, we need to refocus, that maybe Afghanistan is no longer the central front in the war on terrorism. Um, as you look at Yemen, as you look at what else is happening, uh, is, uh, are you, uh, do you think that that's right, that we need to uh, pivot now and it is a time, obviously we have a plan for a transition and, and, and there's many elements of this um, that, that have to still be put in place and nobody is suggesting precipitous withdrawal. but. Uh, do you think we do need to rebalance the uh, level of effort uh, and that, uh, that perhaps uh, the administration's assessment of, of early 2009, that Afghanistan was the focal point, is now the new focal point in countering extremism, uh, more uh, hinging around the Gulf region and in the, in the broader uh, Southwest Asia region, obviously, you know, from Pakistan and in, in through the Gulf? Well, it's, uh, I, you know, I... I I think the, uh, however we started uh, in the, the, the AFPAC review, um, we made a conscious decision in 2009 to view Afghanistan and, and Pakistan and, and India uh, as a strategic, as in a regional, in, in a regional way. Um, for my money, I think Pakistan has, has become more, uh, more of a concern um, where terror is concerned. Uh, than Afghanistan. Um, we have seen, we've watched uh, the migration of Al Qaeda down to, to Yemen, over to Somalia, into Sudan, across the North African littoral, and then down into the Maghreb uh, Sahel regions. Um, I've always been very worried that, that their ultimate goal is a country like Nigeria. Um, the, the good news, uh, to the extent that there is any, uh, the good news is that the body, the, the intelligence body of many countries have really worked together very effectively in, in exchanging information in a timely way. Um, and there's been really astounding uh, level of cooperation that has pre prevented uh, any major attacks since, since 9-11. Uh, nobody would have predicted that, you know, that we'd be able to be that successful. My sense is that where terror is concerned, and particularly the Al Qaeda-like movements, that we know a lot more about them than a lot of people think, and we are at least staying abreast of where they are and where they're going, as opposed to trying to find them and chasing them around. We know kind of where they are, and we know who their players are, we know who their leaders are, and we've had astounding success at 
at uh, neutralizing uh, substantial portions of, of their of their uh, their leadership. Um, I mean, I don't know who'd want to be designated as uh, as a leader right now because that puts you know he'd be walking around with a bullseye on his back. And if we get to that point, I think that that's good. Now, um, Yemen is is going to be is a problem, and uh, it's it's so chaotic that I, I don't even want to speculate on on how it might come out. But we know that Al Qaeda and one of the notorious leaders of Al Qaeda is based out of there. This is going to be a a, a time where you know countries like Saudi Arabia and other countries are going to have to step up to the plate and do some of the things that traditionally you know, we have done. Um, they're a wealthy country. Um, they, they, uh, this is on their border. Uh, we can be helpful in many ways, and we should be. Um, but it's going, to be, uh, it's going to be a team effort. It's not going to be the United States all by itself uh, in the future. And, and on this issue of Saudi Arabia and, and, and the team effort, we certainly have been on the same team in Yemen. Mm -hmm. But it's not clear going forward we will be on the same team, partly because the Saudi desire for the future of Yemen <clears throat> and the future for all the countries surrounding is not this, this rapid transition toward democracy that we've talked about. Uh, and we've seen the, the way the GCC has responded to a number of things and, and opening up to, to Jordan and Morocco and other places. Much more conservative. We've seen tremendous U.S.-Saudi tensions erupting mm -hmm. uh, over the last four or five months. Mm -hmm. How do we think about building a partnership with Saudi Arabia when increasingly Saudis see the United States, A, neglecting the Iranian threat, B, promoting subversion in the entire neighborhood, and fundamentally being a threat to Saudi Arabia rather than a bulwark for Saudi Arabia? Well, on the... Um on the Iranian question, um, I, I, I would I would disagree with uh, with the notion that um, the, the the Saudi U.S. relationship is uh, is not is not solid. Uh, having participated in many of those discussions, uh, I would also argue that that what has happened over the last two years with regard to Iran and its nuclear program is that we know a lot more now. And, um, and there's greater exchange of information uh, at the national levels with regard to the, the status of the program and when it, and when it might be, uh, when we might be approaching kind of a, a point of no return. Um, and so that part of it, I think, is, is pretty solid. And, I, and we have done an awful lot with Saudi Arabia, a country that I think is uh, very, very key in terms of, you know, um, uh, very key in terms of uh, what happens in the region, obviously, but also is a key partner uh, for the United States, and we should not uh, let anything happen that would uh, derail that, despite occasional disagreements. Um, on the on the question of uh, of um, terrorism. Um, we have really worked very well with uh, with Saudi Arabia, uh, very effectively, particularly on on you know on their border with Yemen, and and I I really think and I'm hopeful that we'll work through this period of time and and whatever whatever bumps we have right now will will uh, smooth themselves out because in the strategic sense, um, I I completely agree with those who say that you know don't lose sight of Iran and all of this, you, you know that. We're talking to Libya earlier. That's a tactical question, but the strategic question uh, is what happens in Egypt, what's happening in Syria, um, and Iran. Um, and the, the one way in which um, the Middle East peace process could could really uh, affect the outcome of, in the region is by having some progress in the uh, Israeli-Palestinian uh, stalemate. Uh, that would, I think, be uh, a, a reversal in, in terms of Iranian uh, fortunes, and that would be something that they really don't want to see happen. They really don't want to see Syria uh, fall, and they really don't want to see a peace process uh, started. Um, and we should do everything we can, I think, to 
make sure that the exact that that does in fact happen. And it goes for Syria as well. Pardon me. That goes for for making sure make, seeing that Bashar al-Assad falls. Uh, in my view, yes. Okay. One other plate that's still reverberating that we haven't talked much about in general, as, as we mentioned earlier, you spent a great deal of your time trying to advance the stabilization of Iraq. Uh, the whole question of how we leave Iraq uh, this year, or if it's a little bit longer, if, if we're surprised mm -hmm. that the Iraqi government does ask us to stay longer in some form. Um, obviously, it's going to have a big impact on, on some of our key <coughs> partners in the region, beginning with Turkey, and, uh, and the question of how, uh, whether we've done enough to uh, end the terrorism that's launched against Turkey from northern Iraq. Um, what about the stabilization of Iraq as a long-term bulwark against Iranian hegemony? Uh, how the many of the states in the Gulf will view this? How do you? How do you? What do you see as sort of the the baseline of 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 success of a successful disengagement from Iraq later this year or sometime next year? Well, I I, um, I, I was just in Iraq a couple of weeks ago, and I, I actually revisited uh, the northern part. Which, where, where I'd been last as a colonel in 19, uh, 20 years ago, 1991. And uh, I was astounded uh, by, the, by the progress that, that, uh, that is going on in what is now known as uh, Kurdistan, if you will. Uh, you know, shops are open, schools are being built, uh, they've, they've discovered uh, phenomenal amounts of oil and natural gas. Uh, and it's uh, it's a, a really um, quite something to, to see that. On, on the broader question of Iraq itself, um, I'm a, personally a little concerned about um, some of the overtures that I see uh, the, the the government making towards uh, Iran. I realize that they have a tough neighbor, and it's a tough neighborhood, but um, uh, this would be a very bad outcome, I think, if in fact uh, we had a, um, a, a sympathetic uh, government towards, uh, towards Iran, recognizing that they have to live in the neighborhood. But uh, I'm, I'm worried about some of the trends that, that I'm seeing there. I'm worried about Sadr's influence. And, and um, it'll be interesting to see if uh, they do ask us to stay a little bit longer. They do need more help. They do need more advisory help, they need more um, logistical help, they need more training. Um, and, um, but it'll be, it'll be interesting to see if they do that. My personal opinion is they probably, they probably won't, but we'll see. Um, before we, we open this to questions, I, I did want to press you a little more on, on the Middle East peace process issue. And both how we should be working with our European partners to try to move this forward, especially moving the politics forward, because it seems to me it's much easier to have a conference than create the environment in which a conference can be successful. So what is the role of the broader partnership in doing that? What's the role of the United States in creating politics that are, are more conducive to it, especially given the dynamics in Israel mm -hmm which are moving those politics toward more skepticism about the need to make peace now? Well, I think for the last few years, um, we've really missed an opportunity. Um, the opportunity I would describe is roughly a common view between us, the moderate Arab world, and the Europeans. Um, everybody, all of those parties kind of agreed that something had to be done. And generally, everybody agreed on what it would look like, you know, up, up to about 93, 94 uh, percent common, common view of what the solution set would look like at the end. Um, but the two principles um, have not been able to find a path to even sit at the table and, uh, and, and have, uh, have a you know, have even the slightest uh, progress uh, towards uh, something that is both in both their interests. So uh, the tragedy here is that um, things are things are now going on around them that did not exist, uh, you know, six eight months ago or a year ago, and um, and so now it complicates things, at least 
for those who don't want to make any progress on this, they use that as an, as an excuse. Oh, it's just not the right time. Um, but time is not on uh, anybody's side here. Uh, we have a very important vote coming up in the uh, United Nations, I think in September, mm -hmm. where it's quite possible that more people, more countries will recognize the state of Palestine, will recognize the state of Israel at the end of the vote. And then we are, the United States will be put in a very difficult position of having to decide what to do about that. Uh, again, uh, I've, uh, you know, compared to some people, I haven't been working on this very long, but, but uh, by the same token, whenever you come into it, you know, the problem is always the same, and the solution is always the same. Um, nobody is suggesting that this is a light switch where it, before anything's agreed to, everything, every, everything has to be agreed to. Uh, I think, I think uh, there's a recognition on both sides that it's going to take, it's going to take time uh, before you get to uh, you know, a final status, if you will. But you've got to start. I mean, th this, is, this is a critical moment, likely very historical, and it's, this is a piece of it. And this is probably the one piece that would reverberate around the world like a, like a ripple of a rock being thrown in a lake, but reverberate far uh, further out in the globe than just about anything else that, that, that could be done. And I find it um, frustrating in the extreme that we can't even make the smallest step uh, towards making, making that happen. And I, I, I I continue to just shake my, to just be uh, amazed that um, we don't have the the, the leaders of, of uh, the the leaders who the two leaders who are involved cannot find this this accommodation, which is which would be good for both countries. Thank you. Um, you've been very patient. We're going to open it up <coughs> to questions. I would ask that you restrict the scope of your questions to what we've been discussing, essentially. <coughs> Uh, the Middle East and Mediterranean Basin writ large. Uh, I would ask that until everybody's had a chance to ask a question, you only ask one question, that you ask your question in the form of a question, which is to actually ask the general a question, rather than making a statement and saying, what do you think of my statement? Steve has the unenviable job of making enemies by calling on people. So, oh, okay. and do we have microphones? We, yes, we, we do, do have microphones, do. so if you'd we also wait for a microphone, thank you. Uh, Harlan Ullman here in the front row, and then I'll go to the back. If, if you would just ide if you just wait for the microphone, please, and because uh, we are recording this, and then uh, uh, since I always wanted to be a lieutenant colonel in the Marine Corps, I thought I'd ask you an appropriate question. Um, as we wind down from Afghanistan, and something happens in Libya, one way or the other, uh, what do you see the future of NATO post Afghanistan, post Libya, uh, with a summit coming up next year in Washington and budgets going south? Could you just speculate on? how you think those events in Libya and Afghanistan might possibly impinge on NATO's future? I think, I mean, that's an excellent question. Um, I, I was very uh, pleased with the uh, NATO summit uh, in Portugal in December and, and the uh, adoption of a new strategic concept, which um, bode, bodes well, I think, for, uh, for the alliance and, and how it might be used uh, uh, in, to face the 21st century uh, conflicts. Uh, clearly, um, if uh, Afghanistan uh, is a disaster for some reason, or it just, you know, we, we wind up leaving and, it's, and it falls apart, uh, and uh, that will be uh, obviously a very bad uh, lesson uh, and leave a bitter aftertaste in most people's <laughs> mouths, and who knows what the impact would be. But, um, and, in, and in Libya, you know, I think we're operating under a mandate that, uh, that was levied by the Uni United Nations. And uh, so I think that's a little bit a horse of a different color. But I really think that the question for NATO uh, is, you know, what is NATO willing to do in this proactive envelope uh, and to you know, what is, what, is the, what is NATO's role, for example, in, in helping Egypt, um, you know, transition to a more democratic form of government, if that's what the people want? Uh, and how do you do that? And are you willing to do that? Or is, is NATO going to sit back and, again, take a reactive and, and defensive posture that, that 
says we wait for bad things to happen and then we talk about them and then we react to them. So I, I think that's the pivot point here for, for NATO. And, and what does it do next? Um, uh, I'm you know, cautiously optimistic that uh, Afghanistan, good enough, uh, will be what we achieve by 2014. Um, and we'll see how it goes. Okay, I'll entertain them. So I just, uh, I will entertain a two-finger question. If you're truly disciplined, and I'll come back to you, uh, Admiral Lowen. Thank you. Lauren, I'm sorry. Don Lawrence, here of the Tory Group. Don? The, uh, just as a follow-on to that question, uh, given the nature of the type of events NATO has been involved in, ISAF in Afghanistan, uh, certainly in Libya, and the potential for NATO expansion involving many more people, even beyond the queue that has established since the fall of the Soviet Union to that uh, Mediterranean rim, to perhaps the Levant, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps the non-aligns. What do you think the prospects and the utility for continued NATO expansion are? Maybe before you get to that, it just the gentleman in the back, was your question on this in this area on NATO or was it on something else? Okay, well, so okay. no, I just thought if we could cluster a few, if there are any more. Go ahead. Yeah, my, my feeling about uh, NATO expansion is that um, NATO people should, uh, countries should be admitted to NATO um, having proven themselves uh, in a way that they bring they bring value to the alliance. I don't think I, I don't I don't particularly sign up to the idea that you know we bring. Uh, sick children into the into the alliance, and with the idea that well maybe they'll get better if they're part of us. Uh, I think that we should hold the standard pretty high uh, for what it takes to become a, a NATO uh, member. I also think that we should take a look at um, the, those countries that want a an association with NATO but don't necessarily want to be members. And right now they're all lumped together. Uh, in, in one big pile. Um, and so I, I, am, uh, I, am, I am for putting the brakes on expansion, uh, at least for a while. Um, NATO needs to get its own economic house in order, and we have to do, have a lot of internal discussions on, on that. Um, we've got a new strategic concept. Um, but I think that um, trying to um, uh, differentiate between countries that are on a membership track and what it is they have to do to eventually get to that full membership and countries that simply want the partnership. Uh, I, I think we can have better clarity between them. And uh, so that's, that, those are two things, those are a couple of things that I think I would, I would do. But I, 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 I would be more insistent that new NATO members bring value to the alliance and, and they have to prove themselves of being economically viable, uh, governmentally sound, you know, free of corruption, uh, and add capacity to the alliance in, in some way in the security portfolio. Could I just intervene here briefly here on just, and we'll come to the next gentleman's question, but uh, one country that is seeking a much closer relationship with NATO in this region is Israel, uh, and also some of the Gulf states. Um, I, they're not actively seeking membership, but I'm sure they would, if a, a NATO missile defense system were built, I think uh, several of the Gulf states in Israel would be like to be uh, uh, integral members of that organization. Do you think that's a good idea? I, I don't, I wouldn't rule it out, I, but again, I, I, I think that I would, uh, we, we have the NATO, I mean, the Mediterranean dialogue, so there is an affiliation there for countries like Jordan and Israel. There are seven, seven members, but uh, a lot of them North, North African rim countries, um, to have a partnership with, uh, with the alliance. Um, and that would, to me, could include missile defense. Um, it doesn't, uh, I don't know where you, where, you, where you draw the line between what members do and non-members don't do. But uh, I don't have any problem with, uh, you know, greater partnerships. I, I just would, my lesson learned would be, you know, don't, don't bring countries into the, uh, into the alliance that aren't, haven't proven themselves to be uh, worthy of, of uh, membership. Okay, thank you. The gentleman in the back, even patient, please. And then I'll... Um, you um, emphasize the importance of scrutiny on uh, the Iranian nuclear program. 
And I, and I understand that your concern is absolutely legitimate because... Could you pull the microphone just a little yes, closer? Yes, sorry. Thank you. you emphasize the importance of scrutiny on... First of all, my name is Mohammed and I'm with the Center for Justice and Peace Building. You emphasize the importance of scrutiny on the Iranian nuclear program. And I think that your concern is legitimate because nuclear, nuclear technology, nuclear power has the potentiality of wreaking havoc uh, on Earth. Um, however, in the case of Iran, um, like they claim that their program is for peaceful purposes. And, but international stakeholders have concerns about their nuclear ambitions that, that at some point in the future they might, they, they might develop nuclear weapons. So, my, so I think that this is legitimate. However, I would like to ask, what about other um, players in the region? What about, for example, um, the state of Israel, who's not even a signatory to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, how do we promote um, uh, American credibility in the region as a as a uh, as a an impartial peace broker? Sure. Uh, when we um, turn a blind eye to one stakeholder and hound the other, mm -hmm. and um, I was just wondering if if um, maybe an even-handed approach would um, uh, bring about real stability. And, uh, and, genu and just genuine and just peace in the region. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, um, obviously a, a complex question. Um, the the fact of, of the matter on Iran is that the door is still open to uh, to Iran uh, to do the right thing. Uh, nobody is trying to restrict uh, nuclear power from from Iran for peaceful uses if that's what they wish. Um, but w what the world uh, body uh, politic has asked for is some assurances that um, this is in fact what they're doing and, and they won't even provide provide that so um, you know there's and there's there's a fair amount of evidence that suggests that they are in fact uh, trying to develop a nuclear weapons capability the the, uh, ap the the fallout from that would be a nuclear arms race in in the Gulf uh, there's no question about that. And uh, the, the perhaps even worse is this is a country that exports terrorism and um, exporting weapons of mass destruction, particularly nuclear weapons of mass destruction, if they acquired the technology, would fundamentally change the, way, uh, change the ways of the world that we live in. It's that simple. So uh, these, are, these are big stake issues. Um, as far as... Um, uh, our, our policies uh, with regard to uh, other, other countries, um, obviously uh, consistency um, is important. Um, I think uh, this administration has done a, a very good job in uh, showing our commitment to reducing uh, our own nuclear stockpile. Uh, the START Treaty was uh, uh, in, uh, indicative of the fact that both Russia and the United States took their Responsibility, uh, responsibilities uh, seriously. The successful conference that was hosted by President Obama here in Washington in 2010, I think it was, in the, on uh, proliferation uh, was a big success. So I think there are a lot of things that are, that are going on, and I, and I think the U.S. has generally uh, tried to be very consistent and even-handed, uh, and, and has shown that it's willing to lead by example. Um, in, in trying to rid the planet of, uh, of nuclear weapons. Uh, but the Iranian uh, obstinacy here has been, has been a problem, and I can assure you that we've tried everything uh, in terms of approach, reason, uh, respect, sovereignty issues. Um, and so far, uh, so far nothing, nothing has worked. And so we're now at the sanctions level of a, of a linear track um, uh, but we're at the sanctions level, and, and uh, we're hopeful. We're hopeful that uh, um, the leadership will have a moment of uh, clairvoyance and, and do the right thing. But we have not seen any indication that, uh, that, that that's um, going to happen in the near future. There's a question over here. Um, if you could just wait for the mic, please. Thank you, General Jones. When you look at uh, Could you country, yourself? I'm sorry. yeah, I'm sorry, Bill Koenig. Yes. With Koenig International News. Okay, thank you. You bet. Uh, General Jones, when you look at country after country in the Middle East, we have conflicts, tribal conflicts, Arab versus Arab, 
Uh, right now, Israel has in their northern border 50 to 55,000 rockets and missiles pointed at them. Also, Hamas has uh, probably smuggled in more weapons in the last four years than the previous 30 years. So why should anybody expect Israel to live in peaceful borders or secure borders by, uh, by cutting a deal with Hamas who won't even recognize Israel's right to exist? In other words, putting Hamas into Judea and Samaria and East Jerusalem would put that country, Israel, at great risk. And why do we continue this peace process when we have so poor examples throughout the Middle East? Thank you. Well, um, the uh, the the fact the, the reason I bemoan the 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 fact that uh, nothing's happened uh, over the last few years is because um, the more we wait, the harder it seems to me. The harder it gets. And you do have this question of Hamas and uh, and what to do about that. Um, the the fact is that the the, the Fatah um, in the in the West Bank has generally been a a, a pretty good success. Uh, if you look at the quality of life, the standard of living, trade, economic opportunities, uh, the difference between the West Bank and and Gaza uh, is noticeable. Um, the United States uh, and others have pledged to. Um, underwrite Israel's security, at the same time um, to respect the sovereignty of uh, their neighbor, uh, the Palestinian, the so-called Palestinian state that, that will someday emerge uh, next door. Um, but it is, it is not in anybody's interest to wait uh, until the situation gets worse and then try to fix it. Uh, you're, co you're completely correct that, that the, uh, the threat uh, escalates but um, I think that, that I, I personally believe that uh, by tackling this problem um, uh, now, uh, we'll, we'll make it easy. We'll, it's, this is an easier time than if we wait another two or three years. Um, and a lot of it depends on what happens in Syria, what happens in Lebanon, what happens uh, you know, in, the, in, the, uh, in North Africa to a certain extent. What's the new Egypt going to look like? But not to even um, make the slightest progress on this very, very difficult problem that just just boggles the mind because it's in uh, I think it's in both it's it's in the interest of both states. There was another question here. Yes, I'm sorry, and I'll come back to you. Yes, sir, uh, right here. Uh, hi, Jim LeBlanc, uh, Unity Resources Group. Uh, General, first of all, thank you for your comments and your service to the country. Um, very appreciated. The question I've got is more of an overall general question of the reality check that we haven't heard a lot about today so far of what's going to end up being a dramatic lack of uh, loss of influence by the United States in the region in the coming years and months uh, with you know, massive deficit reduction. The United States isn't going to have the amount of money to throw at the problems anymore. You've got other regional players coming up, whether it's the Gulf Cooperation Council, Saudi Arabia. The way we've approached Yemen, Bahrain, um, Libya, Syria. Um, I'm just, what are your thoughts going forward into the future of how much serious influence the United States will in fact have? I think it's uh, very essential that uh, the United States uh, maintain its, uh, its leadership position um, in the 21st century on these issues. Um, yes, we, we do have some uh, Limitations, uh, obviously, as to what it is we can do economically. Um, hopefully, we'll get those sorted out. Um, but I think that that um, my experience uh, in this global business is that um, much of the world wants the United States to continue to play a leadership role and does not want to see us uh, abandon uh, that position that was earned the hard way. Um, in the 20th century. But I think we have to um, figure out uh, how we change the institutions that, that uh, will enable us to do that, not only our own national institutions, but some of the international institutions. We have to uh, 
prevail upon uh, other players um, who are, uh, you know, rising powers economically uh, and otherwise uh, to see the wisdom of of uh, joining in a partnership to um, make sure that these outcomes that we've been talking about for the last hour or so, in fact, um, come out that way. Uh, my, my personal view is that the United States uh, is still looked at uh, in, in, um, as, a, you know, as a shining light on top of the hill, if you will, whatever analogy you want. Um, but our values, our freedom, uh, our way of life, uh, how we assimilate uh, our society, uh, how much of a contribution immigrants have made to who we are today. I mean, we are a, a crucible where people can look at us and see a little bit of themselves and, and see it in a way that says, you know, we, could, we can live like that. We, we can have, we can be governed like that. We can have hopes and aspirations that we, we haven't had before. And um, so the world is changing around us. You know, our relative influence may wax and wane a little bit. But uh, I think it's extremely important that, that we find, we not turn our back on what's going on in the world and, and that we try to find other ways in which we can uh, play the, the responsible leader and hold and meet the expectations, I think, of many, many people around the world uh, uh, for that by way of uh, demonstrating that leadership potential. Just a brief commercial message. Uh, apropos of the general's comments about the desire for many countries still seeking U.S. leadership, you'll see in your fold as a reference to a, a new study that uh, CSIS is just putting out on uh, the rise of the rest, in a sense, how many countries around the world are looking at U.S. Po uh, uh, power and the future U.S. power, uh, accepting all the limits that uh, the general pointed out. But anyway, so for your future edification, edited by our able uh, introducer, Craig Cohen, uh, who was started up. But there was a question over here, sir. Yes. Jim Stark, Department of the Navy. Uh, general, you, you talked uh, earlier in your remarks and also in, the, in answer to this latest question about uh, the need for the U.S. to exert a leadership role. And yet when it came time for an international coalition, to do something about the situation in Libya, uh, the U.S. response was to lead from behind, uh, thereby causing a good deal of uh, uh, consternation uh, and concern among some of our allies. Do you think that's the proper r model for the future, and do you think it's working well? Uh, I don't necessarily think it's a model for the future. I think it had, it, it's the model for the, for the moment. Um, and, um, you know, I frankly... Uh, um, I, I frankly uh, like uh, the idea that uh, other countries are in the lead for a change. I mean, we, we have been doing this for a long time uh, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, uh, different parts of the world. Um, there is a, uh, an urge, there was an urgency in Europe that, uh, uh, that um, you know, catapulted uh, other governments to, to act. Um, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily uh, uh, an alarming thing. I, the United States is contributing greatly to supporting the operations, uh, obviously. We, we, can, we enable an awful lot of the, uh, of the activities that are, that are ongoing. Um, but I, it, you know, it, it, I, I think it sends a good message to our American people who, you know, look, who have gotten used to seeing the United States being you know, the only one or by far the dom most dominant country in terms of um, expending treasure and blood uh, uh, on the battlefields. Um, so I, I, I think that at the end of the day, within the alliance in particular, this will have a, this will have a good effect. And it really illustrates that we're all in this together and that everybody's got to do their, their fair share. And, and uh, so to have this, what I think will be a, a one-off type of uh, um, engagement structure it a little bit differently is not a bad thing. There was another, there's another question over there. Okay, I'm sorry. Over in the far corner. I'm sorry. I have a little trouble seeing around the podium. Yes, sir. If you could just wait for the microphone. Thanks, General. My name is Joe Straw. I'm from the New York Daily News. Specific to Syria, I was wondering what you thought um, are the best hopes or options 
for positive change there, even if it's is as simple as stopping the violence against innocents there? Well, again, the crystal ball doesn't uh, doesn't work in, in all of these cases, but I think um, the uh, Assad's influence uh, will never will never be the same, uh, even if it's stopped tomorrow, and he, somehow he manages to uh, remain in power. Uh, he's been, I think, exposed for you know what he is, and uh, and the world uh, will form its opinion based on that. Uh, I don't. Um, I don't know what the next, you know, what the next domino is uh, in Syria, but it, but it's clear that uh, that his standing uh, in the uh, in the court of public opinion, at any rate globally, has suffered uh, irreparable damage. General, there was one. There was one. Uh, we need to close in just a moment. Unless there's another question out there. I, I, there is one wonkish sort of question that you uh, you made a comment about UCOM and AFRICOM, uh, and uh, we saw in the beginning. I thought some of our military participants here might pick up on on your point. Um, we saw that very early on in the Libya conflict, suddenly uh, General Ham, who th who had in his AFRICOM hat, had seen himself as largely a security cooperation provider and not so much a combatant commander, or at least certainly that was the way many people saw the command suddenly was thrust into that and uh, into, into being a combatant commander. And, uh, and then in the aftermath, there seems to have been some discussion about bringing AFRICOM and UCOM back together more closely. In other words, that perhaps complete separation isn't a good idea, particularly as we look towards dealing with um, uh, security cooperation and where some of the key problems are going to be emerging uh, affecting European and transatlantic security in the coming years. Do you think, uh, how, how did you see that? And do you think there's uh, some need to, to bring the two uh, back more closely together? I mean, obviously, as you said, you, uh, AFRICOM is in Stuttgart. It's not exactly all that distant from uh, interaction, regular interaction with the European Command and other aspects of NATO. But uh, do you see any any, uh, any need for rethinking uh, the AFRICOM's mission and and how the two commands relate? Well, um, before AFRICOM, uh, UCOM had 91 countries. Uh, when you count all the African countries and and the European countries, um, you know, frankly, I was very fortunate to have a, a wonderful uh, deputy commander for UCOM named General Chuck Wald, and um, and he basically ran uh, the UCOM piece of it while while I was preoccupied with NATO. Uh, now, by responsibility, uh, that was my responsibility. But uh, you you really have to be willing to delegate uh, because you can't you just can't handle uh, 91 countries the way. The way you should be able to you should be able to do so. I, I think the establishment of Africom is a good idea. The the unfortunate uh, reality of Africom is that it's not in Africa, and and frankly, it's not in Africa because we teed it up wrong. Uh, we 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 insist on calling unified commanders combatant commanders, and you cannot sell a combatant command structure into another country. You just I mean, I totally understand that. Mm -hmm. Having said that, um, the other thing that we didn't do um, is we didn't properly resource AFRICOM, you know, in the same way that UCOM has been resourced. Now, um, what does that mean? It, it means that, uh, obviously, if you're going to have a, a, a unified commander uh, called AFRICOM, he's got to be, he's got to have some assets and, and the budget and everything else that's required. Uh, this is evolutionary. Um, but this nation received a great gift um, in the in the late in the in the 20th century by having uh, a global presence with these unified commands in, in most of them in the theaters that they were trying to affect in in our own hemisphere in Panama uh, in the Gulf um, and um, and we have now seen uh, I think a, a disturbing. Uh, tendency to pull back on these on these uh, unified commands. I think they. I think. I think we should think about ways in which the unified command structure should be changed in terms of what it is they do, because I think national security now is is much more complex and there's uh, than than just uh, the military equation, which is what we do best. But um, there, there we have regional. Opportunities here with these forward-positioned uh, unified commands to really affect uh, uh, large parts of the world in a positive way, 
and I would hate to see that go away. Um, I think how you build those commands could be a little bit different. There has to be a civil military relationship that's, that, that's forward based, that has a regional focus. Um, so I think the idea of AFRICOM is still good. I think the implementation uh, needs to be pursued a little bit more. Okay, well great, thank you General. Uh, first, on behalf of all my CSIS colleagues, I want to thank you first for your service to the country, to your service to the transatlantic community as, as SACUR and in many other ways. Uh, also as a devoted member of our board, now back for a, a second term after your government service, so we thank you for that. And I hope all of you in the audience found it as illuminating a morning as I did, and we would like to join me in thanking General Jones thank and Admiral Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think you now, if you have your instructions, to pick up your box lunches and uh, head to the next sessions. Uh, the mid thank, the, you, uh, thank you, Admiral. Thank you. Thank you very session. much. Thank you. It's In good to see you. Thank you.